Hi, and welcome to week seven of History 363, Life and Death on the Eastern Front. Last week, as you recall, we began our discussion and analysis of the Holocaust by considering what the historian Christopher Browning has called the crooked path to genocide. We considered uh, and examined the development and escalation of Nazi policy toward the Jews, uh, my policy of discrimination, of legal, social, and cultural exclusion, uh, toward a policy of isolation, imprisonment, ghettoization, uh, and then finally, uh, particularly uh, after uh, the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, a policy of mass elimination, mass extermination. Uh, the turning point, as you'll recall from our reading of Roseman last week in our discussion, uh, the sort of turning point, or at least a pivotal moment uh, in the chronology of the Holocaust, is the Vance Conference, January of 1942. The outcome of the Vance Conference, uh, again, as you'll recall, is that implementation of the so-called final solution to the Jewish question would be placed in the hands of the SS, uh, headed by Heinrich Himmler. Himmler's office oversaw the transformation of concentration camps into death camps and the construction of new uh, mass extermination points. Um, just as an aside, I'll mention that the first concentration camps uh, in Germany had been built already in the early 1930s, shortly after Hitler's coming to power, uh, built to house political prisoners, uh, ordinary criminals. Uh, new camps uh, are being built now after 1942. And again, the construction and management of these new camps is placed under the direction of Himmler's office and in particular uh, entrusted to one of his deputies, Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann, uh, whom you recall from our readings and from our films. Last week, Eichmann was the SS officer in charge of coordinating the logistics of what would be a massive undertaking. It was Eichmann who made the trains run on time. It was Eichmann who ordered the fuel to, uh, to power the trains, who drew up the timetables, who drew up the schedules. Um, in the phrasing of, of Doris Bergen, a historian of the Holocaust, you know, it was Eichmann and the Vance Conference that, that marked a decision. Rather than killers going to their victims, the victims would be brought directly to their killers. I mean, that's one of the outcomes of Vance, a transition from the roving bands of Einsatzgruppen uh, that we saw in the period after Barbarossa, now uh, the mechanized, industrialized, assembly line nature of, of mass factory-style killing. Eichmann personally, uh, by all accounts, shied from the side of blood, and yet it was Eichmann who got the Jews to the death camps. He was placed on trial uh, many years after the war, in the 1960s, uh, on trial after the war in Israel, Eichmann would famously claim that he was simply following orders. He was simply implementing orders from those higher up on the food chain. We'll talk about the moral implications of that line of defense um, in our discussions. The Vance Conference, <clears throat> again, as you'll recall, had decided on gas as the most effective, the most efficient means for exterminating the Jews of Europe. The Nazis of course, had experimented with gas earlier in the war against Soviet and Polish POWs, and uh, after 1939, against German mental patients as well. Himmler's office suggested the use of mobile killing vans, uh, as you can see in this photograph, uh, vans in which the exhaust would be rerouted back inside the vehicle to poison the victims with carbon monoxide. The first gas vans uh, were used in the fall of 1941, even a few months before the Vance conference. At Kelmno, uh, gas vans were used to kill Jews brought in from the Vuj ghetto. Uh, SS analysts determined that this was more efficient 
than shooting. Uh, but the idea of permanent gas chambers was more elegant and more efficient still. And so gas chambers were constructed at the new extermination camps of Treblinka, Sobibor, Lublin, Kelmno, Belzec, and the largest and most notorious, Auschwitz. Here you see uh, Auschwitz, Kelmno, Treblinka, uh, Belzec. It's hard to make out from this map, but the death camps are clustered here in Poland, in occupied Poland. Uh, why in Poland? Because that's where most of the Jews were and the Nazis thought it a more efficient arrangement. Now, part of what makes the final solution, I think, so chilling, so unsettling, uh, was the coolly efficient way that Nazi administrators, technicians, as they were euphemistically called, organized and engineered the process. From 1942 forward, uh, what we see are the principles of scientific organization, engineering, management, the factory system, the industrial system, the tools of 19th and 20th century progress and innovation distorted and put toward the end of mass killing, devoted to mass killing. And I think there's something, again, particularly uh, chilling about this sort of distortion of uh, enlightenment notions of, of progress. Jews from all across the ghettos of Eastern Europe were rounded up, herded onto trains, and sent to the extermination camps. Um, most of these camps were located along uh, railway lines. They were reachable by rail, and deliberately so. Auschwitz, for example, lay at a major railway junction, part of a main line with connections to uh, every major city in German-occupied Europe. The Jews, taken from their homes or from the ghettos, uh, singled out for destruction, were told in most cases that they were being resettled. The truth was kept from them uh, in most cases till the very end. Years later, a survivor asked, why did we not resist? Why did we Jews not resist? He answers, I know why. Because we had faith in humanity. Because we did not really think that human beings were capable of such crimes. And here you see a famous photograph of Jews, Polish Jews, uh, being herded uh, into uh, a line and prepared for deportation. Jews were crammed into rail cars, often as many as 80 or 90, to a wagon. Uh, in many cases, the journey would take days uh, without food, with limited or befouled water. The cars were uh, unheated in the winter, stiflingly hot in the summer. Uh, the windows were boarded up uh, to prevent anyone from escaping. Uh, so the conditions inside these cars were uh, nightmarish. It's estimated that in some cases as many as 20 to 25 percent of the prisoners on the trains died either of starvation, suffocation, or exposure even before they arrived at their destination. Here you see the gates to the most infamous of the extermination camps, Auschwitz. And this is the camp, of course, that we will be uh, sort of focusing on in our readings this week by Philip Muller. The slogan above the gates reads, Arbeit macht frei, work makes free, or work shall make you free. A hideously ironic slogan. The photographs that we're looking at here are from a very rare, uh, but now often reproduced, uh, album of photographs, sometimes known as the Auschwitz album. Uh, SS personnel were under strict orders not to take photographs uh, at the camp. And this is almost as if the Nazi administrators were ashamed uh, of what they were doing or, or reluctant to... to create a kind of photographic documentary record. So these photographs are uh, extremely telling. Uh, and, you know, we only have, you know, in the case of the Auschwitz album, 140 or so pictures uh, and scattered images from other um, camps. But they're uh, horrific 
but extremely telling insights, uh, I think, that we can get from these photographs. What you see here, uh, the new arrivals, or freight, uh, as they were referred to, being inspected by SS uh, personnel, including doctors uh, and nurses. And here again, in another photograph, uh, the new arrivals uh, being uh, inspected. You can see uh, the camp uh, personnel, of course, in uniform, and here uh, the Zonderkommando, the special units, um, distinguishable from uh, uh, everyone else by their striped uniforms. And this was the uh, detachment uh, in which um, Philip Muller worked. We'll talk more about the Zonderkommando uh, in our discussion this week. There were procedures in place uh, for sorting new arrivals to the camp, like these Hungarian Jews uh, who arrived at Auschwitz in the summer of 1944. Uh, those who were fit to work uh, were sent into the camp, where they were put to work in the factories or to make rubber or load coal, essentially uh, slave labor. And this was the case at Auschwitz. Uh, other camps, for example, uh, Treblinka, uh, dispensed with the sorting process altogether simply gassing every single man, woman, and child who passed through the gates. 99% of the Jews who exited the wagons at Treblinka were dead within two hours. The prisoners were stripped, shaved, tattooed with an identification number, uh, transformed in essence from human beings into ciphers, all part, uh, deliberately part, of, a, uh, of an organized, concerted dehumanization process. Here you see a photograph of Rudolf Hirsch, who was the commandant uh, at Auschwitz for much of its operation. Auschwitz, uh, excuse me, Hirsch, the commandant of Auschwitz, was captured uh, by the British toward the end of the war uh, and tried for war crimes. He described in his testimony what was done to those inmates uh, who were deemed unfit for work after the selection process. Hearst testified that these were sent immediately to the extermination plants. Children of tender years were invariably exterminated, since by reason of their youth they were unable to work. We endeavored to fool the victims to thinking that they were going to go through a delousing process. But, of course, frequently they realized our true intentions. We sometimes had riots and difficulties. Very frequently, women would hide their children under clothes. But, of course, when we found them, we would send the children in to be exterminated. It would take 15 to 20 minutes for the screaming from the gas chambers to subside. At some camps, we know... German guards kept motorcycles revving outside the gas chambers so that the engines might drown out the screaming of the victims. Again, everything done under the auspices of secrecy to prevent the other prisoners from knowing what was happening, although, of course, the other prisoners could not help but have known. After the victims had been gassed, the bodies were piled up outside the gas chambers Squads of Jewish prisoners would pick through the corpses, removing anything of value, gold teeth, hair, eyeglasses, shoes. Uh, this was a task entrusted to the so-called Zonderkommando, again, these special work units. Uh, here you see a photo of Zonderkommandos at work at Auschwitz in August of 1944, uh, a mass incineration of gassed bodies. Again, the kind of thing, uh, the kind of horrific detail that we get from the account of Philip Muller. Items taken from the dead bodies were to be carefully catalogued in minute detail, and then, with horrific irony, shipped back to Germany, where the material was to be used to support the war effort. Between October of 1942 and August of 1943, the death camp at Treblinka sent to Berlin 25 freight cars filled with women's hair to be used as blankets, rope, 
248 cars filled with clothing, 100 cars of shoes, 400,000 gold watches, 320,000 pounds of gold rings wrenched from the fingers of murdered Jews. This from one camp alone, Treblinka, in a period of less than a year. And what you see in this photograph is not a pile of bodies, but a pile of boots. The owners gassed the boots, then shipped back to Germany for the war effort. Here, a photo of eyeglasses from Auschwitz, taken from the prisoners. Mass murder presented certain logistical problems for the Nazis. Specifically, what do you do with the bodies? Uh, hasty burial was tried, open field burning uh, was seen as inefficient. Eventually, specially constructed crematoriums were, con were built. Uh, crematoriums designed by some prominent German engineering firms. The burning of bodies requires an enormous amount of fuel. It produces uh, a great deal of smoke. And even though after the war, nearby residents often claimed that they had no idea what was going on in the camp, the billowing smoke and the uh, stench of burning bodies, particularly open field burning, uh, would have been difficult, if not impossible, to ignore. By December of 1941, even though starvation had killed many Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, the population there still numbered around 350,000. By December of 1941, the Warsaw Judenrat, the Jewish council in charge of the Warsaw Ghetto, had received reliable reports about the Einsatzgruppen massacres that were taking place to the east. Uh, British intelligence, as an aside, uh, was reasonably well informed about the Einsatzgruppen activities already in the summer of 1941, and by December of 1941, so too were the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto. By April, of 1942, just a few months after the Vance Conference, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto had received confirmed reports about the death camps. Now, the news reached the ghetto, of course not from German newspapers, uh, but through networks of rumors and through informal chains of communication. And I mention this to point out that despite the best efforts of the Nazi regime to uh, isolate the Jewish people, to cut them off completely from the society around them, uh, there were still conduits and channels for communication and information. In April of 1942, the time came for the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. The Nazis in the general government ordered the leader of the Warsaw Judenrat, Adam Chernyakov, to provide detailed maps of the ghetto and lists of all the residents, male and female. And on July 21st, 1942, Chernyakov and the Judenrat got their orders. They were to arrange for 6,000 Jews a day to report to the loading platforms at the train station just outside the ghetto. Certain exemptions were granted. Uh, Jews employed in German factories producing war material were exempted from the deportations. Those uh, members of the Judenrat, the Jewish council, and those intimately connected to them were exempted. Uh, but everyone else was not. Everyone else was subject to deportation. And Chernyakov, the head of the Judenrat, uh, a very different kind of man than uh, Rumkowski, the head of the Wuj uh, Judenrat, the object of so much ire from Sirokoviak, Chernyakov knew what would happen to the Jews he was asked to select 6,000 Jews a day. He knew that they would go straight to the death camps. And he pleaded with the Nazis to expand the list of exemptions, but without success. After failing to save a group of orphans from deportation, Chernyakov committed suicide, and he wrote in his note, I am powerless, my heart 
trembles in sorrow and compassion. I can no longer bear all this. My act of suicide will prove to everyone what is the right thing to do. With Chernyakov dead, the Nazis simply appointed another Jewish man to replace him as head of the Judenrat, and the deportations continued. Of the 350,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto on New Year's Day 1942, only 45,000 were left by September. In nine months, more than 300,000 Jews had been deported from the Warsaw Ghetto, sent to the extermination camps. It's at this point that something rather remarkable happens. As one survivor put it, condemned to die, we need no longer fear death. And the remaining Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto, some 45,000 or so, mounted a final heroic show of resistance. In the winter of 1942-43, the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto sent a message to members of the Polish underground, the Home Army, right, the partisan units fighting the Germans behind enemy lines, the Polish resistance movement, and the message read, we are organizing a defense of the ghetto, not because we think it can be defended, but to let the entire world see the hopelessness of our battle as a demonstration to the world and as a reproach. As a demonstration and as a reproach. As a show to the world which had done nothing to stop this massacre taking place in Eastern Europe, as a show of defiance, as a reproach to the world, as well as, of course, a blow against their hated Nazi occupiers. And here you see a young, uh, uh, a group of young uh, Jewish men and women from the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, weapons had been smuggled in uh, to the ghetto by the Home Army, the Polish underground. And here you see uh, in this uh, group photo these young men and women prepared now to fight back. On January 18th, 1943, when Nazi soldiers surrounded the ghetto to begin the final deportation of the remaining 43,000 Jews, the men and women of the ghetto fought back. Again, they were armed with rather meager weapons. As you can see here, they've uh, here posing with some uh, guns that have been smuggled in by the Home Army. But this first conflict, January 18, 1943, uh, resulted in 50 SS soldiers being killed and a German retreat. And by all accounts, the SS were shocked. Uh, after all, they had sort of bought into that ideology that Jews were subhuman, that Jews were weak and incapable of mounting armed resistance, and the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto put the lie to that uh, racial thinking. For two months... A standoff ensued. The Germans encircled the ghetto, cut off all food, hoping to starve out the men and women of the Warsaw Ghetto. The Jews had built an elaborate system of underground bunkers and tunnels beneath the ghetto. Uh, they had built uh, generators, so they had electricity. They had access to water. They had stored up enough food that they could hold out for weeks. With matters at an impasse, at the end of April 1943, the Nazis decided that a full assault on the ghetto would be too costly. And so beginning on the eve of Passover, the Jewish holiday, uh, the Nazis proceeded to shell and burn down each and every building in the ghetto, one by one. And the Nazis, having demolished a building, would then have to go down into the cellars uh, where the uh, resistance fighters of the ghetto had, had, had secreted themselves. They had to uncover and capture each underground bunker one by one. And this photograph uh, shows you the uh, uh, German soldiers uh, having uh, brought these Jewish resistance fighters up from underground. By the time the last uh, Jews were brought up out of the ghetto on May 10th, uh, to be shot in the streets of Warsaw, not a single building in the ghetto was left standing. Not a single structure remained intact. And every Jew in the ghetto had been liquidated. Here you see a shot of Warsaw 
in flames. The Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto held out against the Nazis longer than some countries did. It's a remarkable fact. But between the fall of 1943 and the summer of 1944, the remaining ghettos in Eastern Europe, Łódź, Lwów, Vilnius, Kraków, Kavno, dozens more, were liquidated, and their residents deported to the death camps. Here you see a photograph of Auschwitz today. It's now become not a tourist destination, that's not the right word, but a site of memory, a site of commemoration, memorialization. Uh, and you can see the rail lines that still uh, exist, that once carried the wagons full of Jewish prisoners to their destruction. At Auschwitz alone, as many as 1.5 million men, women, and children were killed, either worked to, de worked to death, starved to death, felled by disease, victims of uh, horrific medical experimentation, or simply gassed and burned. 90% of that 1.5 million were Jews. The remaining 10% included political prisoners and Soviet prisoners of war. Treblinka was a close second, approximately 900,000 killed. If you add up the toll across the ghettos and ditches and camps, evidence suggests that the Holocaust claimed more than 6 million Jewish victims. As many as 600,000 uh, gypsies, the Roma people, at least 3 million ethnic Poles. All in all, a death toll of 10 million victims of the Nazi drive to purify the European continent. And appropriately enough, the Hebrew word for the Holocaust is Shoah, a word which in the Hebrew language means annihilation. The task set before them by the state was performed with dedication by Nazi executioners, building the camps, organizing the rail transports, designing the gas chambers, constructing the crematoriums, the process was carried out, again, with a sort of assembly line precision. Orders were executed with an eye to efficiency, with a frightening sort of moral indifference and detachment. And using the full technology and bureaucracy of the modern state, the Nazis managed to destroy two-thirds of the Jews of Europe, destroying tens upon tens of thousands of families, in many cases without a single trace simply following orders. 